I'm talking with Tom Malone, who is the director of the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence. Tom, exactly what do you mean when you talk about collective intelligence? So I like to use a broad definition of collective intelligence, which is groups of individuals acting collectively in ways that seem intelligent. Now by that definition, there's been collective intelligence for a very long time, at least as long as there have been humans, because families, companies, countries, armies, all those are examples of groups of individuals that act collectively in ways that seem intelligent. When you say seem intelligent, do you mean seeming is not necessarily reality? Well, it means in part that uh, whether you consider something intelligent is a subjective judgment on the part of the, the viewer or the, the watcher or the analyst. It also means that groups of individuals like armies and companies and countries and so forth can also sometimes act in ways that do not seem intelligent. So it's important to remember, I believe, that collective stupidity is just as, imp just as possible as collective intelligence. Is this an extension of a single individual? An individual is trying to make the decisions that will work best for him, but very often it's the wrong decision. So you're saying it simply works the same way in groups as well? Sure. There's no reason why groups are necessarily intelligent any more than there's any reason why individuals are necessarily or automatically intelligent. So if collective intelligence has always been there, what's new about the research you're doing in it? Well, in the last few years, there have been some very new examples, some new kinds of collective intelligence. Think of Google, for instance. By this, I don't just mean Google the company. I mean the whole system of which Google is a part. Millions of people all over the world creating web pages, linking those web pages to each other. The Google technology harvesting all that knowledge so that when you type a question into the Google search bar, the answers you get sometimes seem, often seem, amazingly intelligent, at least in a certain sense of intelligence. Another example would be Wikipedia where there, I think, the most interesting thing is not the technology, though they use a very nice wiki software. What I think is most interesting about Wikipedia is the organizational design. Wikipedia has figured out a way to get thousands of people all over the world to collectively create a very large and amazingly high quality intellectual product with almost no centralized control, and by the way, for free since they're almost all volunteers. So do you see your research turning into products? Well, we think that Wikipedia is a good example of an organizational invention, not just a technological invention. Uh, we hope that our research can spur both technological inventions and organizational inventions or innovations. Our goal is not specifically to develop products ourselves, but we hope that some of the new systems we develop and some of the insights we uh, develop will be very useful to people who are developing products. So what's the main focus of your research? Well, the core question we ask ourselves is how can people and computers be connected so that collectively they act more intelligently than any person, group, or computer has ever done before? Are we talking about organizations now? For example, Let's say you have a manufacturing company. It makes widgets, and it has engineers, it has marketers, it has people who buy the raw materials. So how would collective intelligence be used to make that company be more intelligent, in other words, more profitable? Well, I think there are many ways collective intelligence could be used to make a given company more intelligent or more profitable. Um, uh, to start, let's talk about prediction markets. A number of companies have been experimenting with using prediction markets to kind of gather the intelligence and the knowledge of people throughout their company or even outside of their company uh, to help predict what their sales are going to be or when a certain product will actually be completed or perhaps what a competitor might do. Mm -hmm. Another way companies can use collective intelligence would be to help with difficult research questions. For instance, there's a company called Innocentive that lets other companies outsource, in a certain sense, solving difficult research problems. Um, uh, if you have a difficult question to be solved, like how to synthesize a certain chemical compound, 
you might post that. You, a company like Procter & Gamble or Eli Lilly, might post that problem on the Innocentive website. And then thousands, over 100,000 scientists, engineers, others around the world have access to those problems that are posted. So is it all basically about clear communications and greater access to information? Or is there some other ingredient in collective intelligence that makes it qualitatively different from past ways of solving problems? Well, I think cheap communication, that is the ability to communicate very widely all over the world to thousands of people at almost no cost, that's one of the fundamental things that's enabling many of these new kinds of collective intelligence. But just having cheap communication is by no means enough. You also need patterns for using that communication to connect people in ways that are productive. Are there any types of tasks which would not be susceptible to collective intelligence or any types of problems which no matter how many people you had collaborating and how freely they were sharing their information, it would be really, really hard to ever solve this problem? Sure, there are lots of examples where these new kinds of collective intelligence are difficult to do. Um, of course, since I define collective intelligence in a very broad way, any company or any hierarchy or other kinds of organizations could be considered collective intelligence. Uh, but uh, there are certainly examples where what you might call crowd intelligence uh, doesn't work well. For instance, if you want to have a crowd of people identify terrorists in uh, pictures from a, an airport, um, you might need to be careful about the fact that the terrorists themselves could be looking at what's going on and trying to shape or sabotage your results. Now problem solving is very important, but one difficulty is that people often have very different ideas about what the problems are. Um, for example, if you're considering a law that will benefit rich people at the expense of poor people or vice versa, um, your decision might depend on which category you consider yourself to be in. Uh, people have opposing interests. Uh, something that I consider a problem, you might consider a good thing, or vice versa. So can collective intelligence lead to a consensus on what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Well, uh, collective intelligence, again, uh, exists today all around us. So a democracy, a political democracy, is one form of collective intelligence. We have ways of making decisions about what we will collectively do, even if we don't all agree on what the answer should be, we at least agree to abide by the group or democratic choice. So I think collective intelligence in that broad sense can certainly deal with these kinds of complex, ambiguous problems. The question is not just can they deal with them at all, the question is are there new kinds of collective intelligence that can help us deal with these problems more effectively? Here, I think there are some interesting examples. For instance, one of the projects we're doing that I think is most interesting is a project to harness the collective intelligence of thousands of people all over the world to help come up with a plan for what we humans can do about global climate change. We think it may be possible to combine the kind of intellectual rigor of the Sims game for the whole planet uh, and the, uh, the power of discussion of a Wikipedia-like system for controversial topics and the collective decision-making power of an electronic democracy on steroids. Mm. Now that might get into some core value questions. For example, it could turn out that the biggest cause of global warming is that there are too many people. And what are we going to do about that? Nobody is volunteering to leave. So, no. what do, like if, if millions of people are starving, uh, do we try to save them or do we not do anything? And that's, that's a values issue. Absolutely right. That's a very important question. It's very much a values issue. And part of what we hope can happen in a system for solving or dealing with these problems collectively mm -hmm. is that we can explore a much wider range of possibilities and hopefully find better solutions than would have been possible otherwise.